Well, thank you so very much. And now to introduce Randy Galloway, Mr. Ed Warder. Good evening. I'm here, I assume, because Dale Hansen and Troy Aikman were unavailable. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, long overdue honor. I'm sure you all remember the pandemic delayed this festive event for nearly two years. And, and that reminds me that soon after Randy invited me to present him here tonight, my wife Jill and I were walking through our neighborhood when I remembered that my friend Larry, who I had not seen, in a long time was a huge Randy Galloway fan. In fact, that's how he knew me, not from years covering the Cowboys for the local papers or decades at ESPN. He knew me as a guest on Randy's radio show. In fact, he thought my name was Eduardo, <laughs> which I blame Randy for his pronunciation. Anyway, so I crossed the street to his, across the street to his driveway and tell him, hey, Randy's been elected to the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And he repeated what I told him and immediately passed out. He put his hand on his parked car and slid to the ground flat on his back. We had to call 911. It was during the coronavirus lockdown, so the next thing you know, six or eight first responders wearing gloves and masks are arriving, and half of them are looking at me like I'm the one who needs medical attention. Totally, totally true story. So I guess my point in that is, if Randy's biggest fans like Larry are surprised by his inclusion in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, imagine how the rest of us feel about this. Actually, when you think about it, how could Randy not be in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame? I mean, he's an accomplished writer and broadcaster known for having a cigar in his teeth, a Miller Lite in his hand, ostrich boots on his feet, and a bottle of Tabasco in his leather duffel bag. I just know this for certain, I would not have had the career I've had in sports journalism without Randy. I probably would have never covered the Cowboys for the Dallas Morning News, which means I probably never get hired by ESPN. Uh, Randy used his influence to convince Dallas Morning News executive editor, uh, ex-executive sports editor Dave Smith to hire me. In fact, he had supported me with such fervor that just as it seemed I was about to be offered the job, Randy called and said he had to stop advocating me for me because he was concerned my candidacy was in jeopardy because Dave was afraid it would look like Randy was calling the shots in Dave's sports department. That's how powerful Randy was. In fact, another time, I'd written a major Sunday feature for the Sports Day Sunday cover on, the, on Cowboy Safety James Washington and had a late disagreement with some changes that had been made. Frustrated, I called Randy at home on Saturday night. I read the story to him as I had written it and as it had been edited with the proposed changes, Randy told me I was totally right and that I should call Dave immediately. I did exactly that. I spoke to Dave and he seemed a little irritated when he picked up the phone. And then I made a huge mistake. I told him I had called Randy first and that Randy agreed with my position. <laughs> Dave is furious and he said, that's the problem with you, Werder. You think Galloway runs this department. Tonight I feel a sense of vindication. Randy was incredible to those of us who had less job security, less power, and less influence. And by the way, that was everybody else on the staff. He used his to our benefit. I've never known a columnist who did more for beat writers. Randy had a unique ability to convince people to talk to him, even people he criticized, like Jerry Jones. I did the same thing, and Jerry wouldn't talk to me at all. So we often, we often learned information from the conversations that he had, and he shared that with the beat writers who used them to break news. And Randy never publicly or internally took any credit for that. In this competitive, egocentric business, that's extremely unusual. I talked to former morning news baseball writer Tim Kirkchen. He had the same experience when he replaced Randy on the Rangers beat in 1982. Kirkchen broke a story that Al Oliver wanted to be traded. Kirkchen got the byline, Randy deserved the credit. Kirchin also shared that following Galloway on the Rangers beat at the time was like following John Wooden as a basketball coach at UCLA after 10 national championships. He said it was unbelievable how popular, big, and great Galloway was when I took over. I'm scared to death because I'm like 14 years old. I've never lived in Texas, never covered the Rangers. You know, Kirchin's like this tall. 
<clears throat> and he says, I don't know anything about anything other than baseball. It made it so much easier because I went to every player and I said, hey, I'm Tim Kirchin replacing Galloway on the beat. And that's all I needed to say because I was immediately in with every one of them. Half of them said, great, I'm glad that SOB is gone. <laughs> Kirchin said that, not me. <clears throat> And the other half were sad and going to miss him because they had so much fun with him. But most of the guys said to Kirchin, I hope you can drink. And here I am, the worst adult male drinker ever, and I'm following a guy who's legendary. <laughs> Traveling to games with Randy offered many life lessons. One of them was that the trip was not a success if you returned with any of your per diem. <laughs> While most of us regarded our meal money as supplemental income, Randy believed in spending most of it to have the best possible time and then donating whatever is left in the form of tips to those who served us. That led to many disagreements about how size, what size tips we should leave, Randy always insisting on absurd generosity. He always sat in first class and he often upgraded his colleagues. I recall uh, once on a flight home from New York, very early on Christmas morning following a Cowboys-Giants game, I took a seat next to Randy. I was exhausted from a long day of coverage, the early wake-up call. Sit down, Randy's having a Bloody Mary. I mentioned to him that my wife had warned me not to come home grouchy to the kids on Christmas morning. To which Randy said, Janine just hopes I come home standing. <laughs> I hope I haven't told any stories, Janine, that you've not heard. But I'm also not done, so hang on. <laughs> Randy was never subtle. He was everything too many columnists today are not. He was unafraid, opinionated, truthful, and yet responsible. He wrote what he believed. He wrote for his readers and spoke for his listeners. He was respected by those he criticized, like Denny Freeman. Burt Hawkins, the original Rangers PR man, once said that Randy had one style of writing. Quote, pick up the biggest rock you can find and throw it through the nearest window. One thing Randy taught me was this. During a commercial break before an appearance on his radio show, he said we were going to predict the Cowboys record in the upcoming segment. I told him I thought they'd be about 10 and 6, and that's what I planned to say. And Randy said, well, that was a stupid order, because if, they, if you pick them 10 and 6, then you can't criticize them if they win 10 or 11 games. So Randy wanted a bigger margin for error, and so I'm pretty sure he predicted 12 and 4 every year for Barry Switzer. And speaking of Switzer, Troy Aikman, when I talked to him this week, said, in his opinion, one of great Randy's greatest achievements was calling the Cowboys head coach by the nickname he created, Gunsmoke. He also called Deion Sanders nine-toed after a football injury. He called Jason Garrett Red Jesus. I think he might have been wrong on that one. <laughs> Finally, I reached out this week to two-time Cowboys Super Bowl winning coach Jimmy Johnson, who famously called Randy's radio show before the 1994 NFC Championship game against the 49ers and said, put it in three-inch headlines, we will win the ball game. And they did. So Jimmy Johnson's message to me this week will finish my introduction. He said, and I quote, put it in three-inch headlines, Randy Galloway is a Hall of Famer. Randy Second person to put a ring on your finger. Ooh. Oh, very nice. Uh, what to tell you about Werner when he was a newspaper man? You could believe most of what he said. Then he went to ESPN, became famous. He's full of crap. Most of those stories. <laughs> most of those stories. Well, a lot of them were true, though, which is uh, which is kind of frightening. I I love to see Denny. I haven't seen Denny in a long time, and. Uh, I gotta disagree with you though. I love retirement. Man, do I love retirement. Now, I do nothing and I'm damn good at doing nothing. <laughs> but uh, this Jimbo saving thing, I'd like to be right in the middle of that thing, boy. <laughs> that is uh, one interesting, uh, one interesting uh, story. The, uh, 
When this class, I guess we'll call it a class, was first announced a couple of years ago, uh, I got a call from Jay Black. Boy, I was proud, pleased, feeling honored, feeling pretty damn good about myself. And the, uh, I'm getting texts, getting emails from people I'm saying some nice things. And then uh, I got a text from a friend of mine. And it said, congratulations, do you think you deserve this? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking this over and that finally hit me. I'm slow, but I'm thorough. That ain't a compliment, damn it. <laughs> so I, uh, Babe, radio boy, where's Babe? Babe will know who I'm talking about. I texted him back and I said, I don't know if I deserve it, but I'm damn sure I'm gonna accept it. So I'm here tonight to say I accept it. And I'm proud to accept it. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. And it's great to the people that are being honored here tonight. It's great to be included uh, with this group. Uh, uh, this is a, a story that I know Denny will understand. And uh, it goes back to when I was in the eighth grade. Think about that, the eighth grade. When I was in the eighth grade, I think it was three years after the Alamo fell. <laughs> but uh, I came home uh, from Lee Junior High in Grand Prairie when they'd been to track practice. Came home, uh, the Dallas Times Herald was in the front yard. And the, uh, by the way, we were not a blue collar family. We didn't reach that high up, but we were a two newspaper family. We took AM, we took Dallas Morning News, PM, we took the Dallas Times Herald. And I always grabbed the sports section, went right to that, both papers. And the Times Herald that day, there was something new on the left, left hand side of the page. And I read this and I went, that's what I want to be. I'm going to be him. And this was 1958 and it was Blackie Sherrod's first column in the Dallas Times Herald. He had just been hired from the Fort Worth Press. I had never heard of the Fort Worth Press. I had never heard of uh, Blackie Sherrod. But I went, wow. Now that is something right there. So I even told my mom when she got in, she worked in the women's department at the Dallas Morning News. Remember those days, Shereen? Women had to work in the women's department. <laughs> and uh, I think it was under, she worked in food. I told her when she got in, I said, Mama, I'm gonna be him. Well, I went through, uh, I went through about the next seven, eight years, I was gonna be Black and Sheridan. I'm not, as Diddy will tell you, in those days, any boy, male, remember that, Shereen, only males in those <laughs> were sports writers. And uh, everybody wanted to be Black and Sheridan. And uh, so this, this, I mean, my dream was not uh, anything different than a lot of other guys. But I, uh, I wrote my first uh, first story I ever wrote, and I still have it to this day. It was the Grand Prairie Banner, which was a weekly shopper. And I'd gone down there, talked to the guy who owned it, and I said, I will cover the Lee Junior High, Jefferson Junior High, the two junior highs in Grand Prairie, the annual rivalry football game. Now, I was in the ninth grade by then, and I actually uh, suited up for that game. I didn't say I played. I suited up for that game, and then afterwards I wrote about it. And I love my lead because I thought Blackie would be proud. And that lead was the Lee Bears, rolling like the mighty Mississippi, swept the Jefferson lines away, 20 to zip. You know, we were right on the banks of the Trinity. I could have used that. But I went with rolling, Mississippi. I said, this is Blackie stuff here. Now. But, uh, you know, I, I was lucky 
because uh, in my first full-time job, Walter Robertson, the late great Walter Robertson, is my newspaper daddy. Uh, at the morning news, he sent me, Janine and I had just got married, he sent me to uh, Port Arthur. And once I got down there, I was 22 years old, and I was still in the black. I wanted to be blacky, but one day a brain wave hit me. Now, when you're 22 and you have a brain wave, you better forget it because normally that's trouble. But this brain wave came and it said, there's only one blacky and you ain't gonna be number two. And it hurt, but I knew it was the truth. And then the brain wave went, don't ever do it again. And so I, I had to figure out, okay, I'm not gonna be black, but I had to get a style or something I'm gonna go to. And I came up with something real simple. And uh, I went with work hard, be a good team player, and don't be afraid to piss off the reader. And so I used that and survived for 50 years. And then Sports Talk Radio comes along out of nowhere, like in 1985, and I, I'd been a guest on a lot of radio shows, Brad's, Norm's, uh, Dr. Dan, who I was replacing at uh, WBAP, and, and, but I'd never done a radio, that's totally different in hosting a radio show, and I just walk in, I mean, WBAP was a 50,000 watt clear channel blowtorch, of the Southwest and they said you're on six to eight. I didn't know a damn thing about it. So I just sat down and got great help from uh, Jimmy Stewart, the late great Jimmy Stewart, who was a, uh, who, who was my board operator. And I just, well, sat down and started doing the show, but I went with the same philosophy. Work hard, be a team player, and don't be afraid to piss off the listener. So you might think, that my career was based on pissing off people. <laughs> but I really think what helped me more than anything was being a team player. Because when you are a team player, and certainly in the journalism business, it's, an, it's as important as it is in any business, but when you are a team player, people will work with you. And the more people that work with you, the better you're going to be. So I, I hope that what it came down to was that I was a good team player, but I did like to piss off people. And <laughs> I did manage to do that for, uh, for a lot of years. I, uh, in about six months, I'll turn 80 years old. And uh, normally that would scare the hell out of me. 80, I mean, silver alerts and, and everything. <laughs> The pins, I mean, all kind of, I'm not, but actually, I have come to really appreciate my date of birth because it put me right in the middle of the greatest era in Texas, just the golden era of Texas newspapers, and to a certain extent, Texas sports talk radio, but certainly radio. What went on, uh, from about, we'll say 1980, for about 35 years. Never been anything like that in our state. Never been anything like that in the country. And uh, there'll never be anything like that again, obviously. But I mean, it was the war. The war was on between the morning news and I was a columnist by then, so that helped. But, and the Dallas Times Herald. And man, when I went to work for the morning news in 66, we had 12, this is a major, consider a major city newspaper, we had 12 people in sports. Obviously management didn't give a damn. But a decade and a half later, late 70s, we had 16 or 17. Not much growth there. But 1982, 83, we had 110 people in sports. We had 50 to 60 writers. We had eight guys covering high schools. I mean, it was a blowout situation. We were putting out the best se uh, sports section in the country. And that's easy for me to say, but it's the truth. We were, and the Dallas Times Center was just as good. They had blacking. And I mean, the papers were rolling in those days. 
And then in 1992, it it was over. Times Herald folded. One day at a cowboy game, Denny, you remember it well. 1992, we're sitting waiting on kickoff, word comes down, Times Herald's dead. The problem was, there were a lot of Times Herald guys there that, hey, they were out of a job. They were gone. A lot of them were friends of ours. And the other thing, we thought, well, the glory days are gone too because now morning news management will pull up. And they did, which surprised everybody, but I think the Star-Telegram was ready for it because they had been building their sports section, building, building, building. And when the morning news didn't pull back, the Star-Telegram, which was owned by Knight Ritter, which had a hell of a lot of money and owned a lot of newspapers, they came, they came stronger. They were building their sports section because they knew or they thought that the morning news below would go try to go into Arlington. That was strictly Star-Telegram territory. You didn't cross over into Tarrant County. Sure enough, 1997, and we all applaud, applauded at below the, uh, the morning news invaded Arlington. And boy, we're all celebrating another war. This is going to be great. And uh, then my phone rang. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, well, mm. ends up, I go to the Star Telegram after 33 years at the morning news. And people to this day ask me, did you do that for the money? And my answer is, hell yes, I did. <laughs> but I mean, I knew people at the Star Telegram, I knew all these writers, they were friends of mine, and I knew what kind of sports section that they were putting out, and also knew I'd be working with one of the all-time great sports editors, uh, the late, great Soyuz Williams. And that was another thing that was good. So after 33 years at the Morning News, and I went 16 at the Star Telegram, and uh, I never regretted that move because I was about 55 when I did it. And I, I mean, I, they knew at the morning news I was going to work hard, and I never complained about my salary at the morning news. I thought I was overpaid there. But the, uh, boy, that was a kick in the butt. Uh, you had a lot of people paying you, a lot of people depending on, uh, depending on you, and I, I mean, I love that part of it. But, in a career that with a lot of luck, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the way the career went. I'm thankful for the people I work with, like Werner and, and everybody, and a lot of these guys here. And I just saw the great Bill Mercer sitting down there, one of my, one of my all-time heroes from way back. Uh, I do want to say, though, that while this award is the greatest professional honor, the the greatest honor I can have is my family. They're all here tonight. And my wife, Janine, is the foundation of our family. Uh, I've been married all my life. I, <laughs> I think I was 10 years old, a gypsy way. <laughs> but uh, we had uh, two daughters. We have two daughters. <laughs> And uh, they are great people. Boy, they're strong. They are kick-ass. They're compassionate, great mothers, but they're kick-ass people too. They don't. They don't take. It. Uh, and that's uh, Gina and Jennifer. It's Gina's birthday. She can't believe she's fifty-something. Uh, my son-in-laws, uh, uh, Russell and Chad, they build stuff. They fix stuff. Once I figured out the microwave, I don't do any of that crap. I, know. I just call my son-in-laws, and they come over and do stuff. Uh, my uh, grandkids, I mean, hey, principals, teachers, coaches, Coach Buck's here tonight, uh, band directors, whatever, they always say, you got the greatest grandkids in the world, and I do. They, unlike me, they've never, they've never even been arrested. And I, I don't wonder how can you go through high school and college and not be arrested when he's one. It didn't happen. Didn't happen to us. But uh, Quincy, 
who's got her master's at Indiana and Indiana University, now working in Chicago. Uh, Bo, who's a senior at the University of Texas and also majoring in stuff that I can't pronounce, so I'm gonna try. Uh, Georgia is a uh, freshman, just completed freshman year at Oklahoma State, majoring in civil engineering. And then Sadie, uh, Sadie just is completing her sophomore year at Alito. Uh, good student, runs track. She will not be in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame as a 300 meter hurdler. <laughs> However, if they, where's Jay Black? If Jay has a category for, uh, if he has a category for, <laughs> for good kids, she'll be in that. My sister Ellen is here. Uh, Ellen, yeah, we're, uh, we're the last of the original Galloways, but uh, we plan to hang around a while. Uh, we, ain't go, we ain't going anywhere. And uh, all my friends, neighbors, thank you all. Uh, want to point out the Walkers right there. Uh, Janine and I, we went to high school with them. We ran the streets with them uh, in the 50s. And we still run the streets with them. The streets of the world and uh, streets of the United States, Don and Sammy Walker. Uh, Charlie England is uh, a longtime mayor of Grand Prairie. When we were growing up, Grand Prairie was a, it was a town too rotten to survive. And Charlie turned all that around. He brought Lone Star Park to, so I can bet horses. God, I love Char Charlie England. And Jay Black, uh, one guy is here. He's going to be in the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. He's a good friend. Uh, he's the head football coach at Alito High School, won 10 state championships, the most in the history of Texas high school football. Coach Buck, Tim Buchanan. Thank you, guys. But, uh, oh, and I want to dedicate this, uh, uh, this to uh, my mother, Margaret, 60 years, a newspaper woman, and I want to dedicate it to uh, a guy named Tony Ireland. Uh, only Buck knows who that is. He was small town Texas newspaper guy in Alito, weekly newspaper, but I never met a sports writer. I've met thousands of them. I never met a sports writer who uh, loved his job more than uh, more than Tony is. Like I said, I don't know if I deserve this, but I'm damn sure accepting it, and I have accepted. Thank you.